Welcome back to Data Driven Leadership. I'm your host, Jess Carter. And on today's episode, we're talking to Greg Leak, the CEO of Resultant. Welcome, Greg. Hey, Jess. Happy to be here. Um, glad you're here. And so um, the CEO of Resultant, this is newish, right? Absolutely. OK. Uh, uh, how's that going? How's it feel? It's going well. I joined in July this summer, um, okay. about 100 days in. And Good. it's been a fantastic experience. It's uh, Good was excited when I first heard about the company yeah. and even more excited now that I'm getting to know all the people and seeing the great work we do for our clients. Awesome. Uh, have you had any surprises, like anything that um, shocks you or surpri pleasantly surprised you in the first 100 days? Um, I really think the depth of talent that we have, um, I hadn't heard of Resultant prior to getting introduced to the company and interviewing for this position. Yeah. And the more I learn about the impactful work that we do, about the depth that we have, particularly in the public sector, sure. across a number of verticals, I've really been impressed. Um, I'm surprised I hadn't heard of Resultant sooner. Um, and it's a great story. And I'm excited yeah. of like the caliber of people I meet. Like I knew the people were gonna be fantastic, um, but everything's even better than promised. So it's been a lot of awesome. fun. Awesome, okay. Well, so, um, you know, some of the things I'm curious about. So um, when I think about a CEO, someone stepping into the CEO role of a fast growing data and tech firm, mm -hmm. um, that is not a real casual move in a career. Yeah, so um, started my career as a developer um, in a consulting organization at Anderson Consulting way back in the 90s and loved technology. Um, surprisingly, my, my background in college, I had an economics degree, okay. um, but I'd always been a bit of a nerd and was programming ever since I was probably six or seven years old. <laughs> okay. Um, so started to consult and just love technology and coding. And I think throughout my career, it always was looking at the leadership roles in the projects or perhaps projects that didn't go well. Mm. And I always thought, hey, I could do that just a little bit better. And I think the story of my career is, is continuing to move into more and more leadership roles just because I was excited about helping teams, helping people, yeah. um, realizing client opportunities. So from that point, gradually moved on to more client management and then eventually um, running practices at consulting firms. That's awesome. Um, and for me in my career, I've, I've been fortunate. This is the third fast growing consulting mm -hmm. firm um, that I've worked for. Um, in this case, I'm excited to be leading the firm. Um, and it's a great place to be. Consulting is some of the most rewarding work out there for individuals. Um, you grow personally, you grow professionally. Uh, the outcomes that you create for clients are fantastic. Yeah. And then also being part of a fast growing technology firm, there's never a shortage of challenges. Um, there's always new technical technological opportunities to take advantage of. The company's changing on a almost quarterly basis right. because the better the work that you do, the more customers and the more growth. So it's just a ton of fun and it provides awesome growth opportunities for our people. Um, what did you, do you, re, do you have a moment? I'm just curious about this. When you were developing at the age of seven, yeah. like, do you remember something you built or something you did back then? Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so, and, and maybe it was seven, maybe it was eight years old. This was like old school TRS-80, you know, 16K computers Good. with the cassette tape drives. Um, and I remember I would, you know, kind of co your choose your own adventure kind of coding along okay. the way would be writing my little basic programs <laughs> um, and then kind of evolving there into, you know, learning how to create graphics and little pictures on the on the uh, on the monitor. So it was a, a ton of fun. So that always, is so cool. always had an interest in programming back in the day. Did you have like a computer class that taught you that or is this like self-taught? Uh, self-taught. My dad was an IT guy, ah. so he'd bring home the computers from work or would, okay. you know, my go to Radio Shack and get me my awesome TRS-80. Radio Shack. Um, yes. and, and mostly self-taught. That's cool. Um, yeah. um, my dad was also in, um, he was in like computer sales, like kind of the hardware um, okay. and um, printer sales. And so I remember when we had our first computer at home and he brought it home when I was about eight or nine and it was such a big deal. And I just wanted to play Minecraft. Is that what it was? Or it yeah. was, um, what was, maybe that was it. But it was like all the little games. I just wanted to play the little games yeah. on it. Um, and he actually wanted to work. And so we would like, the kids would have to have our own time where we got to play, nice. but I was not coding. I was just playing games. Um, so. I was consuming. Um, coding. So let me ask you this. In the last 20 years, so you've been in tech for a minute here and doing, you know, arguably like you know, you're you're in consulting, so you're helping other people sort of leverage technology and data in meaningful ways. What would you say if you look back 20 years is like the most meaningful advancement in technology looking backward? What do you think came out in the last 20 years that really changed the game from your perspective? Yeah, wow, there's a lot. Um, obviously mobile, I think, has changed the game in so many ways, yeah. right? In terms of particularly the B2C space, how um, brands interact with their their customers. Um, 
you know, I'd have to say probably in the last decade, um, what has happened with data, the, the tools, the ability, the democratization of data, perhaps across organization, the tools available to store, secure, manage, assess data. And then you can also then think of um, just sort of more of the integrating and in, in more mature cases, integrating in insights into actual business processes, whether that's manual or automated, right. I think has become more prevalent. Um, and then now you're starting to see with whether it's, um, you know, um, deep learning, ML, or, or Gen, AI, Gen AI, which everyone is talking about, kind of the, the opportunities there. Right. And, and so much of this is centered around data. Um, yeah. It was an interesting, a, a few years ago, I was at a conference, I think it was a Gartner conference, and, and one of the speakers challenged everyone would be, would you let um, your AI make a billion dollar decision, right? So if you start thinking of the evolution of, first you're analyzing reports, looking for indicators, and maybe you're automating it, would you actually, based on a certain set of conditions or, or assessing a, a trend in data, let a computer make a billion dollar decision for right. your company, right? And I mean, that's quickly what we're moving towards. And I think that is very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and, you know, same question for, I'm really interested in, what do you think about the next 10 to 20 years? What do you think is coming down the pike that's going to be really meaningful for people? We've kind of moved into this. It's not just apps and tech, it's data. Mm -hmm. um, when you look forward, what are you the most excited about? Yeah, um, that's a tough question. Um, you know, interestingly enough, and, and it's so hard because there's probably technologies and trends that are um, not even like on the horizon yet that are going to be the big sure. impacts. But if I kind of look at what's going on with AI and with Gen AI right now, right, we're seeing um, products like Copilot that are helping developers be more effective, more efficient. Yep. Um, and who knows, maybe these tools get further and further along where the interface from like the business user to the computer becomes far more simplified. Right. And we're able to kind of talk to a computer around getting the software, or the programs that we want. Yeah. Maybe we get there, maybe we don't. But regardless, we're going to get so much more productivity and be able to create so much more software faster. Yeah. And when you start thinking about that, we already have a pace of change, which is ridiculously quick. Right. right? I think if you even just think of like the pace of change with the iPhone, like oh 2007, it yeah. feels like it's um, been forever now. We can't live without our devices. Right. Um, when you start thinking about the pace of change and what we'll be able to create and the opportunities, and you know, this is true for business, this is true for how you help, um, you know, governments help their uh, citizens, yeah. or even think about like just solving big world problems. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the pace of having more ability to create more software that, that right. impacts the world, it's going to be remarkable. I, I agree. And I think, um, I mean, that's where, well, let me ask you this. When you look at yourself, are you like an, uh, they have these types, right? Are you an early adopter? Are you somebody who jumps right into new technology right away? Yeah, I'm a ridiculous early adopter. You're a super yeah. early adopter. <laughs> Embarrassing stuff. <so. laughs> okay. Lots of lots of failed devices in my- uh, Okay. So you're willing to like try it, it breaks, you tried it. Um, I have no idea how to empathize with that. I'm so okay. not an early adopter. I want something that will work and it's been tested by other people who come up with the bugs and then it gets, it's yeah. fine. My experience is fine. Um, and so one of the things that's interesting to me is when I look at um, all of the advancement in tech and, and to your point, how quickly it's coming. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like you go to a four year degree mm -hmm. in computer sciences, whatever, um, by the time you're graduating, the industry's changed. Mm -hmm. And so I get really interested to see how how do we educate people for, for technology mm -hmm. and data at the right pace for them to consume mm -hmm. it and jump in and be capable of jumping into a project. Mm -hmm. um, but also how do we look at, um, those who aren't on the cutting edge, how do we help the the greater masses adopt and lean in to tech and data? Because yeah. I do think the, it seems like the data literacy is like a giant sprawl. Mm -hmm. We have these early adopters, and of course in a tech and data consulting firm, we ought to be that. Mm -hmm. Like I will do it, but it's not my natural pers mm -hmm. um, perspective or thing that I enjoy, um, but I will do it because it, I realize the value is you will get better outcomes in your business if you lean in. I don't do it because I enjoy being an early adopter. I'll do it because I, I know that it's the best way for me to get the best outcomes for myself or my clients. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think about in the future, I mean, are there ways that, do you think that sprawl will get wider and we'll have more early adopters and more innovation and this sprawl of data literacy will get, there's just these these people that are behind. And Or do you yeah. think the, the market will help bring that back together? I, I think the market's gonna bring it back together. Okay. 
And if I think about it is the divide between, let's say, um, you know, 10 years ago between business people and technologists yeah. was quite wide. Right. Right. And, and heck, that's why there's been a lot of consulting dollars spent right. over the years. Yeah. Um, I think now is first off, I'll just think of the programs now, like at the university level and everything else. Like, yeah, there is so much data out there. Um, there's even data with sensors about the physical world. And so, you know, if you just even look at the the MBA programs, yeah. they're focusing on much more data driven approaches towards analysis, towards developing strategy. Right. So you're having business people who are more data fluent. OK. But at the same time, when you start thinking of a lot of the programs now that are creating data scientists and data analysts, they have to understand the business issues and they have to have a, at least if they don't understand an industry or a particular sector. They have to learn very quickly of how to come up to speed on that and understand the context mm. very quickly to be good at their jobs. So I think you have a little convergence in the middle. Yeah. And then at the same time, the tools like Gen AI, the interface of Gen AI is fun. Anyone can go and ask a question or ask ideas for a party right. this weekend or whatever that is. Right. It, the interfaces are going to get better. So I think it's going to get okay. more embedded in our lives. And, you know, there always will be early adopters, but I think it's going to be more seamless. Okay. You did bring up a good point, though, about the pace of change. Yeah. I do think, and again, a little off topic here, but um, society being able to adapt to that change as well. Right. Um, it's almost like our technology pace is perhaps faster than ability of our society to be able to figure out how our social structures work. Right. Right. You can see this with social media. You can see this in terms of like what, you know, the, the fragmentation of journalism and yeah. everyone having a podium with Twitter. Right. Um, there's a lot of implications of this that I think we as a society haven't figured out. And there's, of course, going to be a lag with that. And what gets even more concerning, interesting or an opportunity yeah. is that that's only going to get faster. And I think, you know, all of our institutions, when you think about governments, when you think about schools and think about everything, it's going to be a lot of change for for society to adapt to. Yeah, there's this. Um, OK, this is just super interesting. I completely agree with you. And I I I'm a liberal arts kid, so it's mm -hmm. going to show here for a second. I really struggle with, um, you know, we might get more news faster mm -hmm. than ever before, but I'm realizing it is paper cut surface level that I have to leverage my knowledge of geopolitics or history mm -hmm. to appreciate it in its proper context. Yep. And so I'm realizing, I think that there there is so much noise out mm -hmm. there that, if, that the people who will succeed are people who can either understand how to make sense of things mm -hmm. or build tools that will help people make sense of things. Yes. That feels like those are the opportunities next to be like, the data is everywhere. You're going to get data ev yeah. and every tool you buy, you will be able to get the access to your extracts. Yeah. How you leverage that or decide on the ways to integrate insights yeah. seems like the way to uniquely yeah, How you get the signal through the noise. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and interesting, and that could be where an area where you think about Gen AI just for like the knowledge worker, yeah. being able to research something, being able to get information. That's an area where instead of digging through hours and hours of Google searches, um, you can at least get an 80% informed answer right. to help you make sense of things right. along the way. Reduce the research time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so then my other question for you is, um, from a data and tech perspective, are you just into it because you're into it and you think it's neat and fun? Is there a part of you that is into it, that's in, in, interested in data and tech because of the outcomes? Like in your career, I assume you've seen quite a bit of both. Yeah. Where are you sort of oriented when it comes to um, the data and tech for the sake of it versus kind of outcome oriented? I, I think it helps organizations and people just be more effective. And when I think about it, when you think about uh, business strategy, the more simple, the more measurable, the better. And I think that um, because we have the ability to measure so much nowadays, you're able to make much more clear strategies to communicate to your firm, your stakeholders, your investors, everyone, yeah. um, what your strategy is and how you're, you're progressing towards that. And by the way, it's a continuous learning process. You're able to, as an organization, learn from your mistakes, see where you take action and the, the, you, you're able to move the ball forward or not. Yeah. And it's an it's, it's awesome sort of, um, sort of feedback loop that you get by embracing data. Yeah. And this doesn't necessarily mean that them talking like leading edge data science or even data analytics. This is just taking a data driven approach to your business. Um, and it's not just, and again, it, it's not about the numbers. It's also how you take a data driven approach to your people, yeah. to your employee engagement, right? That's where it gets very interesting. And I think more and more data gets weaved into all business functions. Right. Um, and, and you're seeing that. I think leading edge companies, HR organizations, marketing organizations, which probably traditionally have used data a lot, yeah. are using it even more today. Um, uh, so to me, it's just 
doing things better. Okay. It's a better way to run a business. Well, and okay, you brought up two things I wanted to touch on. So one is, um, I think a lot of people when they when they hear about using data to handle um, client experience or employee engagement, mm -hmm. it 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 has this tendency to feel a little bit robotic yeah. and not like kind of heartless. Like, oh, you're yeah. just using data. You're, I don't feel yeah. seen or heard or belong. Yeah. But when you understand and appreciate. I had some other people educate me on this. What we're actually doing through data is creating a refined, simple listening architecture. We're not reducing the ability to, to be seen. We're actually killing, again, the noise to create themes and understand a structure in which people can feel more heard. Yeah. And there's a diversity of thought and an actual appreciation for every voice yeah. through that funnel. And I'd never Absolutely. heard that. So I, I kind of was somebody who was in this um, perspective of, oh, if we just use data to look at our people, we're not really being empathetic. Yeah. And it was actually the the opposite. Yeah, I love that. I, that's a great, great perspective. And I and I also think too is a lot of it is trend. You may, um, you know, an engagement may decrease, and there's a lot of reasons why that can happen. And right. the data is not going to give you the answer. There's a human element to it. You have to talk to your people. You right. have to understand where that is. But that transparency and showing that you understand there's a decline in engagement yeah. to start the conversation to have those really sort of messy human conversations is important, right? So it's yeah. it's it, and. Maybe I overstated earlier, the data is in the end. It helps you be better informed so you can address the challenges in front of you right. in a more effective way. And in a lot of cases, it has to be in a very human way. Okay. So then um, I want to pivot a bit to, um, you know, like your career, you said kind of started really techie and then you got into some of the leadership. You mm -hmm. stepped into those opportunities. Um, I am curious how you would answer a question about, like, in your leadership approach, where does risk fit? No. Are you like a hyper risk taker? Are you, how do you measure and make leadership decisions around risk? Yeah, um, I think it's it's um, informed. T taking taking chances and risk are important. I think an organization, particularly a, a fast growing firm like a result, needs to take some risk at times. Sure. Um, I think it's important to understand like what that risk is you're taking. Yeah. Um, and getting people on board in your firm to understand to do that together. Mm. Um, and you know, again, given the pace of change with technology and everything that we've been speaking about, you're going to have to place some bets. Right. How do you know? How do you put the right structures in place so you know those bets are paying off or not? Right. So it's the whole fail fast mentality. And you want to keep me doing that. You want to encourage that in your organization. So how do you put those structures in place, take the risk, adjust, and if it's a horrible idea, let's let's toss it, right? Yeah. Let's not invest a lot and, and get rid of the idea. But then, um, and also celebrate that. So how do you get celebrate the risk taking so you don't get into a, a position where you're frozen and you're afraid to make the next decision? Okay, yeah, that's really helpful. When you look at um, we were in the middle of doing some strategic planning too. And one, one of my thoughts, my observations has been that my perception is that you are a bit disciplined. Are you a pretty disciplined guy? Uh, not really. You're I, not? Uh, no. Okay, I, I'm, that I'm surprises very, me. Very, yeah, no, no. Um, <laughs> I am I am the worst process follower okay. and feel um, too much process always is is stifling to me. That is so interesting. Yeah. Okay, I've misread you. Yeah. So that was gonna be my, my so it feels like we're, we're going through this, this methodology that feels very thoughtful and, and there's a um, lineage to it. It, yeah. And then we go through and we try, but it feels like you have this room for hypotheses where it's like part of the strategy, mm -hmm. even if there's discipline to it, are hypotheses. Like they're kind of time-based bets on what are we doing and why and what makes sense. And if we're going to pitch it, we'll pitch it. We'll pick yes. something else to try. Is that yeah. right? Yes. And one reason is interesting. I, I don't like structure, um, <laughs> horrible structure. Um, but but I think obviously to, to run a business, there has to be some structure there, but also any business as you grow and, and you start thinking of just digital operating models yeah. and ways businesses are working, interacting with data, interacting with technology, you have to have this fail fast mentality. You have to have this flexibility to try new things. And sometimes process will weigh you down. Yeah. Sometimes if you get too prescriptive or, or too um, the duration of your planning is, is too long term, you're probably going to miss out opportunities to pivot. So the, the challenge for all organizations, this is true for a startup, this is true for um, a fast growing company as a result and even larger companies yeah. is how do you keep that sort of agility and to be able to still move fast and not kind of let your bureaucracy slow mm -hmm. you down. Like um, that. So that's to me, that's incredibly important, something that 
all business leaders should be keeping top of mind. Well, and it's tough. Like, how do you do that? As in my head, I picture um, you know a company that's fifty people, kind of like a catamaran or a yeah. sailboat, and you end up on a cruise ship, and it takes a little yeah. bit more time to turn yeah. around. Yes. And so, how do you integrate? I mean, how do you do that, Greg? How do you how do you keep a company agile as it gets bigger? Yeah, you, you've got to. Um, it's about having the right strategy. Okay. That's clearly and simply, you know, very simple and can be easily articulated. Yeah. And it's empowering your leaders. Um, I think the more decentralized your leadership is, the more able you're going mm -hmm. to be to adapt and adjust. Makes sense. Um, you've got to have lots of strong leaders in, in all parts of your business that have the um, room and flexibility to work within um, the frameworks that you outline to really be successful. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Um, okay. And by the way, there's a great um, article on that. There's a freedom within a framework. I think if you, you Google it is, okay. a, is a way in which um, you're able to put some structure and frameworks around um, uh, your business processes, but give your leaders that, that room to move. And it actually, you know, when you hear framework, people think lack of innovation. It actually can kind of encourage innovation because you know kind of which parameters, what your parameters are and the problem that okay. you're trying to solve. That's super cool. Yeah. It's never great to have to manage people, right? It's great to give people the outcome you want them to go yeah. achieve and then unleash them. And if you've got smart people with their line values, they're gonna do, do amazing things. Do you know in a brief theoretically podcast episode, if you were to advise someone who was in the management process and wanted to move to more of an agility outcome oriented management style, no. like a few quick tips, like what would you tell somebody? Um, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> you know, I think, you know, I, I was going to go to kind of even looking at borrowing some of the um, techniques from sort of even agile software delivery, right? There's a lot yeah. of books out there and some of the principles on there where it's, you know, people over process right. and sort of, it's, and it's a great framework, right? Because it doesn't mean that process is a zero, yeah. but it's people over process. I like that, but I often, um, I often put a little bit of um, caveat on that is that I think that we probably have tried to take agile methodology that was intended for software development and apply it to management. Right. Um, in some cases with horrible consequences. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think some of those principles of, of thinking of that way are actually useful to managers to take as sort of guiding principles with I their like behaviors. That. Okay. Um, and then I think it's about, you know, and then I think beyond that, it's um, really kind of asking yourself and it comes back to what i said earlier are you giving your teams the objective and sort of the constraints to meet that objectives and then letting them go right yeah. and do you trust them do you give them enough room to operate um so they can really kind of work the magic on their own where again you're not having this hierarchical structure right. to be able to slow people down or, or that ultimately slows people down yeah i had this um i had this exec executive coach once give me a kind of level zero to 10 and zero was sort of their brand new employee, their entry level, you know, you have to give them all the guidance. You have mm -hmm. to just direct them yeah. down to a 10 where it's like, I need to tell you the outcome and get out of your way. Yeah. And she was kind of suggesting it's a, it's a helpful tool a few years ago when I was starting to manage people. And it said, you know, contemplate where they are mm -hmm. in your level of what, what you can delegate and how, and then put an improvement plan of how do we get to yeah. your six? I want to get you to an eight. Yeah. Um, and so I thought that was kind of an easy way to really dumb it down and be like, how do you help me understand how to lead differently mm -hmm. so I get the outcome I want? <laughs> and that's great too, because one is it, it helps the person develop self-awareness. Yeah. What they what good looks like where right. they are now, perhaps. And then also the um, the trust in terms of that person can speak up and knows when to ask for help. Right. Right. It's one of those things where um, you start trusting a person when they know when it's okay to work something out on their own but they know when they start getting in the deep water, like this might be an area where I need to go back to my manager yes. to ask some questions. And I think having that trusted relationship where they don't feel stupid going back and asking a question yep. um, and they feel support and self-aware, right? I mean, right. so many people, like I think the key thing for anyone is um, throughout your career, the more self-aware one is as they're thinking about their career and thinking about their development, the better things are. And if we as managers can help people with that self-awareness, yeah. it's a great, great tool to give them. Yeah, man, this is rich. I mean, the other, um, you reminded me of the other piece of feedback I had that I thought was really instrumental in some of my my development has been 
asking for feedback pretty aggressively mm-hmm. and saying, hey, tell me something to keep, start, or stop doing. Yep. And to, if I can do that four times a year with the right people, you're starting to elicit that feedback. And what I thought was funny, Greg, is if it can shock you, I'm not awesome at receiving feedback. I have a tendency to get no, just a little I'm bit defensive. not shocked at all. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, and so what, what people started doing is they would start to come to me when they had feedback that I didn't ask for. Yeah. And then say, they'd say, hey, can I tell you, I want, there's something I want to tell you to keep doing. Yeah. They'd use the language and it would totally take the defense. I, I would hear it and realize they're trying to help me. Yeah. And it was immediately kind of taught me to just receive feedback. Yeah. It didn't matter what it came in. It was a gift. Yeah. Um, but it took me a minute to get over my own um, ego and you know pride or whatever to get there. But that yeah. was helpful. And you're very me. good at giving feedback. So I'm surprised that you've mm. got the challenges with mm. uh, you think that feedback. Everyone who gives feedback openly is always good at receiving it? Oh, yeah. interesting. <laughs> Um, and, it, it, and feedback's also interesting because as people go through their through their careers, um, the more senior you get, the harder it is to get good feedback mm. because so much comes around your soft skills. And while all feedback is valid and you've got to listen to it, I think also as you get further along in your career, you've really got to think about the person that's giving you the feedback, the context they're giving you that feedback in. And there's going to be certain people where maybe you're going to have to discount some of that feedback yeah. because it's not your personal style. Yeah. Um, you're not going to always, um, you know, hit a home run with every person. Yep. Um, so, you know, again, that gets harder as you get further <laughs> along in your career. Um, you're, this is just funny. I, I remember the first client I had that I wasn't really their cup of tea mm-hmm. and I just was so distraught about it. And somebody looked at me who's done consulting longer than me and they kind of laughed and they said, do you like everyone else? Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't like everyone else. And they're like, then why do you expect everyone to like you? Yes. Like, it's okay. Yep. It's okay. That, like, you still have to do your job. Yes. But just, you know, if you're not making a best friend today, that's okay. Yep. Just do a good job. Yep. And it was it was an eye-opening to understand that this is, you know, you can kind of get beyond um, the immediate here and look at the larger picture and realize that there's sometimes where there's a yep. job to do and that's Absolutely. okay. And, and as you get further along in your career, you start realizing what's the best way for me to get the outcomes, right? Right. right. And sometimes it's going to be hard with certain personalities or certain people to get the certain outcomes. And some things you're just not great at, right? Yep. We're not an A plus. All of yeah. us are not an A plus on Everything. every capability. Yeah. So you've got to lean into your strengths and then surround you with people, yourself with people that, you know, kind of make up for those those areas where you're yeah. not as strong at. So as we head into um, maybe the, the end of this year, calendar year, beginning of next year, there are probably a lot of companies that are looking at next year's goals, strategic planning, budget planning, ending the year well. If you look at your leadership experience, do you have any, I don't know, tips as you head into the the last two months, last month of the year and you look forward? Um, You know, it's it's interesting. We we always use the end of the year as like, it's start of a new year, a new strategy, right? You'd hope that you sort of get into this mode of continuous planning, Right. right? Where we're not using these sort of calendar dates, the Milestones, but the reality is, yeah. the, the, the reality is obviously in the business world, sometimes we're, we're driven by that. Yeah. Um, I think it's just looking forward to, you know, um, and kind of the process that we're going through at Resultant right now is what uh, what's the outlook for the next several years? Like, what's the big goal that you're going after, right? You know, at Resultant, we're here to get our, you know, our colleagues, communities, clients all thriving, yeah. right? So how do you how do you really think about how you're going to achieve that mission? And then think about how you're moving the ball forward in the next year. And I think a lot of that comes down to, you know, we're all in planning season. Yeah. Um, it's the sort of um, thoughtful reflection on w- what are those big ones that really are going to keep you kind of moving forward in that mission and, and, and running a successful business. Awesome. OK, yeah. so some reflection, but also some. And that's where I think about to like what's working, what's not. What do we need to change? You, yes. you kind of talked about the agile adjustments to, yeah. that we need to make. What do we need to make for yeah. next year? And I love the you know for businesses, and I would love for and even as as our own firm is getting to the point where you get more of that rolling and adapting versus yeah. using these calendar um, years as a it's a limiting factor, I, I believe. It is, but also it's a human. Like I do think people, t- I think humans are more reflective near the mm-hmm. holidays. Yes, I think there's this like, what have I accomplished? What do I want to do next? I your birthday, you have a bucket list. Like yeah. there's these things yeah. that happen where humans yeah. are more. Yeah, and I think as I leaders, know. the end of the year is a great time for reflection, right? So were you able to be effective? Yeah. Where are your blind spots? What feedback have you heard, or in your case, maybe haven't heard? Oh yeah, um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the end of the year is a great time for that too, cool. for us to kind of take stock as leaders in terms of what we could do better. Awesome. Okay, so another another area when you start when you start thinking about going in the next year, I, I would challenge a lot of business leaders, and and I, I see this even with um, 
government agencies is in terms of when you're thinking about your goals, yeah. what's the metric that you're going to use that will inform that goal, will show that you've achieved that? Right. Um, that thinking can actually lead to further strategic thinking and refining of your goals. And even if you're just baselining this in 2024, yeah. what a great way to get started. And it's not always about achieving that metric, but it's about seeing that trend line. Yeah. And that just helps you get this, again, back to this cycle of continuous improvement and observation, which is so important to right. be able to respond quickly, be, rea be proactive versus reactive. I would suggest that as leaders are thinking of those goals, can they make them as quantifiable as possible yeah. when they're doing their planning? And you said that in a really important way, which is it's very exploratory. Mm -hmm. It's okay if you have a, I think there's certain elements of a business where it's okay for you to have some goals where you've never measured something. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna create a target. And if you hit it or not, you have some trends mm -hmm. and you kind of had a target and you knew what happened. Yes. Again, it's a hypothesis. Yeah. Um, I think that that is, it's neat to have a leader that understands which metrics we must no. hit and yes. which metrics are just good to start measuring yes. and we can benchmark them. So there are new metrics in my department next year that we're yeah. talking about. And it's like, hey, we've never really measured X before. Let's benchmark yes. it and let's create some targets. Yeah. I think that's cool. And, and interesting enough, I had a conversation with a, another business leader recently and she was sharing around how a particular project they had really wasn't gonna make an impact, that they were very frustrated. And I was, you know, I kind of said, well, maybe you can encourage a team by creating these kind of metrics to really kind of go attack that hill. And she kept coming back with, you know, it's not gonna move the needle at all, which then makes me question, why are you doing it? Right. Right? Is it is it it's gonna be frustrating for the team? Great, right. everyone will get an A for effort, they'll do their jobs perfectly, but it's it's not structured the right way. It's yep. not um uh in a way that's going to be meaningful to the business. And, and then in those cases, you've got to ask yourself, why are you doing this? Right. Um, demoralizing for your people and, and arguably your, your resources could be invested better elsewhere. Right. It, com it comes back to that. Um, what's the objective you want? How are you measuring yeah. it? How are you approaching it? The change management. Yeah. And just that discipline. That discipline yeah. is a great way to look at it. Like that conversation I was having to say, is there real value here? Right. Absolutely. So you've been consulting for a minute mm -hmm. um, in your youth. And so my question for you would be, do you like, do you love it and why? And yeah. how are you seeing it evolve perhaps? Yeah. Um, first off, um, I love it. Um, from a personal perspective, it's an amazing way for both personal and professional growth. The variety of work that you see, yeah. um, the standard that you're held to, um, the fact that someone is looking at the work you're doing and, and uh, paying a good dollar amount for it, um, it, it's just an awesome way to, to work. It's, yeah. a, it's a thrill at times. And I think from a client perspective, you are able to see the, the value of your work. Um, when you work with someone to achieve an outcome that they didn't think was possible, right. or maybe even on the project when you started, you didn't think was possible and you right. achieved that, there's nothing better. <laughs> um, so from that perspective, the impact you can make is amazing. Right. Um, you know, when you talk about how it will change, is I, I think a little bit sometimes. Um, I have a good friend who is in consulting and kind of accuses other firms sometimes of, of reading too much of their own press. Mm. I think sometimes the um, the customer gets lost. So when I think about the future of consulting, yeah, um, it's going to be um, digitized a lot like other industries. Sure. Right, and I think that you know, I think ChatGPT for the first time is talking. Think you know, gets consultants thinking of how can they be disrupted. Right. Um, a lot of consulting is analyzing data, researching, coming up with ideas. Um, some of that is going to be today, you know, in, you know, aided and, and, yeah. and augmented. But in the future, you start wondering, how does that change as you get more AI? It's the first time that right. white collar workers are saying, wow, right. what's the impact on my, my industry? And I also think, and again, I, I know we, we, the word data, I think we've said the word data a lot today. <laughs> um, it, it's also going to become more data driven. So, okay. you know, I think. 10 years ago, we relied on a lot of conversations and interviews with executives at clients. Right. More and more, it's about assessing the actual data to see the trends to either test hypothesis or even create hypothesis. Yeah. Um, and that's only gonna accelerate more and more. And I think clients are gonna be looking for more repeatable solutions, yeah. um, automated when enabled by technology, enabled by data along right. the way. Um, that's only gonna happen more and more as we go, uh, go forward. Do you think so? You know, I don't know if this is right or just my narrative, but when I first became a consultant, the image in my head was someone who got on a plane four days a week mm -hmm. and went somewhere and got to stand up in a big room with important people and tell them things. Mm -hmm. And then I came home and I felt amazing about myself because mm -hmm. I was so important, um, which never actually happened in my life. I never did those things. Um, and um, and what I 
I remember this the first time I had um, one of my clients who, and you know, a lot of that was like these big deliverables. There's these mm -hmm. hundred page, three hundred page. Hey, this is what consulting is. Here's your report yeah. at the end. And while that's still consulting, and we've done that, mm -hmm. um, what I think, what I think I've fallen in love with truly, you know, to echo you a bit, is um, there was this really meaningful moment in my career where a different consulting firm walked out of my client's office and they delivered that report. Mm -hmm. And the next meeting was for me to walk in, sit down, and they handed it to me and said, now, how do we do this? Mm -hmm. And that was like, if that's consulting, mm -hmm. I'll do, I'd be grateful to do mm -hmm. this the rest of my life as long as I can. No. I mean, to be able to help people with their complex problems no. and feel like I'm trusted and equipped to do so, no. that there is no higher honor, in my no. opinion. And there's this... Um, I think people have you know these different images of what a consultant is, um, but you know to be highly trusted and have the um, awareness and experience to say I've walked ten other companies through this kind of a transition. I can help you do it well with ten times of experience on what to not do. Yep. <laughs> um, that trusted advisor piece to me is really significant, and mm -hmm. I feel like that's the piece where no matter how much we digitize, mm -hmm. maybe discovery phases mm -hmm. or assessments go more automated or digitized, mm -hmm. but there's this constant need to help a client figure out maybe you know the right thing to do, but you don't know how to get there. Yeah. And I feel like that's always going to be a need. I don't know, is that fair? No, I, I agree 100%. And I think you bring up two, two interesting things in, in kind of your experiences. One is consulting is humbling. Yeah. Um, when you're a trusted advisor and you're entrusted to help someone move something forward, it's, it's a humbling experience. Right. And, and we've got to remember our roles are there are to enable and help them on that journey. Right. We're not the star of the show, right. um, which is which is important. And then the second thing that you you mentioned in terms of the execution of the work, I mean, there's so much, you know, consulting is such a, a catch all for so many things. Um, when you're actually able to help implement that solution and take that idea and actually make it happen, that's been some of the most rewarding parts of my career. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah, it's just neat. Um, hey, Greg, I had a few other things I wanted to ask you before <laughs> we wrap up. Um, these will just be quick machine gun questions. What's yep. your favorite animal? Dog. Uh, favorite technology ever? iPod. Uh, best sitcom? Seinfeld. <laughs> favorite book? I can't, I don't know. Favorite podcast host? Jess Carter. <laughs> uh, cheers. Cheers. I can't think of the, fa the favorite book's a tough one because there's so many. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I feel like that's one that's a that's a the favorite book is one where you're trying to you, you try to pander to your audience, which what you think is mm -hmm. going to sound. What like does everyone think is really smart? Yeah, well, I'm not saying real smart. Oh, okay. And I, it's my favorite sitcom, Seinfeld. It's got to be. It's not the Office. It's Seinfeld. Seinfeld's an important classic sitcom. Yeah. Yeah. Curb, and Curb is pretty good as well. Curb, Curb, Curb is good too. Curb might actually be the answer. Curb is also important. I'm more of a Larry David kind of guy. I mean, well, he wrote Seinfeld, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm George Costanza. The answer is Larry David. What's yeah. your favorite sitcom? Larry David. Larry David. <laughs> Greg, seriously, thank you for being on the podcast. It was a pleasure to learn from you. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jess Carter. And don't forget to follow the Data Driven Leadership wherever you get your podcasts. Rate and review, letting us know how these data topics are transforming your business. We can't wait for you to join us on the next episode.